Okay. I'm Evie. I'm Ray, and welcome to the Pantheon of M. We'll be reviewing the film Howard the Duck, and it's our New Year's uh, episode, so Happy New Year to everybody who's watching the show, and mm-hmm. to you at home. Uh, this is timely, actually. Uh, so my first question to you, Evie, just off the top, what are your feelings towards this film? This film was kind of silly, but mm-hmm. kind of funny as well. You know, I thought it was... Um, for like I don't um, maybe PG, but mm-hmm. it, um, but yeah, it um, tanked uh, because um, yeah, it wasn't good. I didn't think it was that good, mm-hmm. and I felt like I waste my time <laughs> mm-hmm. um, watching it. I don't know. I it, yeah, it didn't really do anything for me. I thought it was quite silly, but kind of funny sort of i don't know what what to make of it do you think it was ahead of its time like do you think it's more relevant more more pertinent now by chance or or no how do you mean uh well well let's see it came out in 86 i mean no one really understood it because it's like it the debate what one of the debates was should this movie be made as a cartoon as a film rather than a live action film you know, oh, okay. that was one of the that's, that was one of the questions that w- the people who were behind the scenes making this film uh, was pondering before it get, before they released it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of what we're seeing on the screen today, you know, in 2022, in the new year, uh, do you do you think it has any kind of relevance to what we're seeing now? In, in, because we're we are reviewing like we are a comic book review movie uh, show TV series uh, review. Um, do you see anything that is sort of relatable now? Um, maybe like um, the Cold War um, countries fighting each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know um, the uh, nuclear race. You right. know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, and uh, but a duck uh, working at a diner, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I don't know what to take to, to okay. yeah, right. help well, me with that, man. I don't know. Okay, all right. Well, here's what how I here's how I look at because I just watched this movie literally like a night like a night ago. So, uh, luckily, I, I mean, I've, I've, I think if I saw this film when it came out because I was aware of this film. Uh, I think, I, of course, I think I would have probably have a very negative like response to it. We're, we're already starting phase four of the MCU, and we're introduced into one of the key uh, or marquee films coming up shortly is uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, right? right. Okay. So Howard is being plucked from an alternative universe, right? Mm-hmm. So we're introduced, we're, we're introduced to a multiverse already in this film. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at it in the context of what are we learning from this film is that there is a multiverse that exists. And um, just to give some people some context, this is Marvel's very first motion picture film that ever they ever had on the big screen in the theaters. Right? It was produced by, the executive produced by George Lucas, a guy who just finished the Star Wars trilogy. So he was at the top of his game. You know, ILM, ILM and Industrial Light and Magic did the special effects and sound, just sound effects for this film. You know, they had miniatures, uh, they used uh, still frames for the animations, the stop motion animations for this, which again, kind of looks cheesy because it kind of reminds you of like, you remember uh, Clash, was it Clash of the Titans, the 84 film? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had kind of like claymation type, like animation of monsters. So, yep. and don't forget, this came out, that came out in 84. So this is like two years after that movie came out. So the idea of stop motion was still pretty, was still pretty in the mix of how things are done. Yeah, okay. so there is boring that theme. I mean, looking at it now, I mean, yes, it's, it's extremely cheesy. They don't have that kind of effect. Uh, the miniature they had was a 15 inch miniature of Dark Lord when we see him, uh, and then they right. blew it up into a bigger screen. So it looked really, really bad on the, I guess, on a larger scale. It introduces us to the multiverse, something that Marvel is introducing to us now. So mm-hmm. it had, so in that sense, it's it's light years, it's 20 years ahead of the game of when it came out. It would make more sense with how it came out now. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in due to the fact of the multiverse, so uh, so I think I think it was a, a miss opportunity or not a misstep uh, because it was so far ahead of this game, and also 
uh, Steve Gerber, who actually did the illustration and wrote the original comic book strip, had that kind of vision, you know. Uh, so, it's, uh, so what, what you're seeing is him being plucked out of the universe where he's from into our into six one six or whatever you want to call a world you're in. That's uh, that's what we're seeing. I get you. Okay. okay. So, uh, in that sense, that's how I see it's ahead of the game. This introduces us to a lot of big known actors. Like it stars Jeffrey Jones, Tim Robbins, and Leah Thompson. Uh, for mm-hmm. both these, for Leah Thompson and Jeffrey uh, Tim Robbins, sorry, this is this is this was their like one of their breakthrough roles. Tim Robbins just basically he did before he did Bob Roberts, before he did all these big big films. This was what he did to help break him through into the ice into Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And Leah Thompson. Just finished the first issue, uh, first edition of Back to the Future a year before this, so she experienced the high, and she experienced the low in the first, in, in one year. So it, it kind of got her grounded in terms of reality of welcome to Hollywood. This is what success feels like, and this is what failure feels like. You know, so I, I think when you see her, when you watch her now in in layman's terms, she's very level headed, very grounded because she's experienced both ends of the spectrum like all at once. And mm-hmm. she did, and at this point, she did like I think about a handful of handful of films. She did like Red Dawn, and All the Right Moves with Tom Cruise, and so she was just getting like she wasn't a, a leading lady yet, but she was a recognized actress at this point, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, I understand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, she mm-hmm. she had her up and da- and down, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel yeah. kind of sorry for her, but still still the still um uh, howard um the duck was kind of funny hmm? uh yeah. major stuff so i don't know it was it was um uh, pretty good mm-hmm. for before um yeah yeah so yeah. yeah no it was the ishtar of its time i mean it it was the if if it was given a razzie i'm sure it has or was uh it is it, it was the i mean it was really it was the butt of all jokes uh yeah. when it's when, when a movie was laid an egg they referred it to as howard the duck it got, it, you know it was it was pretty bad um yeah you know uh the the writer director it was uh william william uh Fitch and uh, gloria stewart they were husband and wife they're the producers and writers for this movie uh um, George Lucas was executive producer, so he kind of backed it. He got the rights for them to film this thing, and uh, he he was totally supportive of their endeavor. You know, and people kind of scratch their heads with this. I mean, Lucas, Lucas, George Lucas, you know, the guy, the guy who brought you Industrial Light and Magic, the guy who brought you Adobe Sound, who is a visionary. You know, maybe not a great director in, in retrospect, but like a visionary of of things to come. You know. Maybe was well ahead of the game with Howard the Duck, like 20 years ahead of the game. No, 30, yeah. 30 years, right? So, you know, it, it's something to uh, to be holding. And uh, Ed Gale, who, who, who's the guy behind the duck, would, is also the guy behind Chucky the doll. You know, so again, a film, uh, a series or, or venture that just started to explode now, like in 2021, 2022, because we, we just had the Chucky series uh, this past fall. You know, it's make it's making a comeback. So all things, you know, who 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 would have seen the future, you know, back then that all these things would still be relevant, culturally relevant today. Uh, the question to you, because okay, so there is some familiar faces. Uh, was there a face familiar to you in the band, uh, the Cherry Bomb, that stood out to you? Um, one of the girls, one of the backup uh, performers. In yeah, this. Holly Johnson. Yeah, Holly Robinson. Robertson, yeah, 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 yeah. That was one of her first like breakthrough roles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as well as Leah Thompson. Um, yeah, you know, uh, she's doing now what she's doing the murder mystery. Um, was it was it morning murder mystery uh, series on you see on like city TV? You know, mm-hmm. like it's kind of those hallmark movies. Uh, you know, she's doing pretty well. I mean, you mean I mean during after this she did Twenty One Jump Street. So this yeah. was the time she jumped from jump where she went from one to the other. But that's her breakthrough role. And what made this kind of, what's kind of cool about this, and I want to put this in the in my blog, is that uh, both uh, Leah Thompson, Holly Robinson, and, and the, at, the, the quartet, they right. were actually singing. And they were actually doing the uh, musical instruments oh, in cool. this film. So uh, that was actually part of the deal. They had to learn how to play the instruments and, and did the choreography. And you know who you know who Thomas Doby is, right? Yeah. Um, blinding, blinding me by my science, the singer. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, he choreographed the routine. He composed the music for them. He worked with them closely to get 
them looking like professional and he designed the music so it's very synthesized uh, the music that you're hearing like the song how the duck that was his uh, writing so that was pretty interesting because you know i grew up listening to you know thomas doby and um you know all the artists back in the 80s of course but like uh, he was a big name and he was very influential to making this happen so um so just a little like, tip for that tat on that uh overall uh i i enjoyed this I enjoy this more, I think, watching it now. I, I like Jeffrey Jones. I think he's a great, talented act, actor. You know, uh, for, for for everybody who watched this, he was. this is when he was doing um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, playing the principal, Rooney. So uh, everyone here that, who are in this film really made their niche after Howard. I mean, Howard, Howard the Duck didn't kill their career. That's, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> Whereas okay. only as good as your last film, uh, the, they all came out of this pretty much unscathed. Um, you know, I mean, the other two act singers and performers on the band, I mean, they're no one knows who they are, but like Holly Robinson, Leah Thompson, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Jones, Tim Robbins, you know, they're all they all went out to do bigger and better things. Even the guy behind the mask of Howard the Duck went on to do Chucky. So, you know, everyone did pretty well. The directors, they they found work. <laughs> People, Hollywood can be forgiving, and they found work shortly after. And now it's a cult hit, it's a cult classic. Um, there's a following of this movie. Uh, people, it's it's found a second coming. And uh, I think Lucas was right. He, he said at one point, give it 20 years, uh, it will find its new uh, its niche. And it has. It's done pretty well. It's in the analogs or pantheon of films. Mm -hmm. So, yep. okay. Cool. So with that, I'm Ray. Happy New Year. And I'm Evie. Happy New Year. Take care. Mm -hmm.